It's a good morning and welcome. I appreciate it's tough being first session of the day. <laughs> and uh, thanks for making the effort to come to this session. Big Data Analytics with Microsoft Excel 2013. Uh, this is a session that covers two distinct territories. From a corporate perspective, an IT perspective, uh, it's really about big data, preparation of big data. Uh, we'll look at using Hive to access big data. And once we've made that available, the second part of the story is really a self-service business intelligence story. How can a business analyst using Excel and with Power Pivot, how can they go ahead and produce a data model that combines both corporate data, connects to the big data, assembles a data model that consists of data from both sources, enriches that model, and then uses it to analyze the big data. My name is Peter Myers, I'm a BI expert, I've worked in this space for over 12, 13 years now, come from a business background, learned the business first, learned IT second, and I think that's made me a, a considerable BI practitioner. And in re, uh, recognition for the community work that I do, numerous presentations, user groups, SQL Saturday events, I've been uh, awarded SQL Server MVP status for the past seven years. The objectives then for this session is to introduce big data. Who here was in yesterday's session with SAPTAC? Okay, so we went through fairly thoroughly what big data was, uh, looked at various scenarios. There's going to be a bit of repeat in the basic theory. Uh, then we'll introduce HD Insight, then I have a demonstration that puts together uh, a solution that we can then query from. Then we switch to the business analyst. I'd put a separate hat on here at this point. From IT Pro across to business analyst, we'll look at using Excel 2013 with the Power Pivot capabilities and the reporting with Power View. I'll emphasize many of the new features that are supported and available in Excel 2013. Finally, give you some relevant resources so you can move on after this session should you need to explore either topics of Power Pivot, Power View, or Big Data. Okay, so let's start by introducing big data. I know there's been a lot of talk about it at this conference. Um, I like to rest on this fairly concise and what I think is an accurate definition from Wikipedia uh, that defines big data as a collection of data sets that are simply so large uh, and or complex that it becomes awkward to work with. The traditional approach has been, well, we need to analyze that data. Let's extract, transform, load that into the data warehouse, and then we can bring it together in our um, reporting and analytics platform. Um, that just gets out of hand when you've got so much volume of data. And we talk about those three Vs of volume, variety, velocity, uh, when it just makes it uneconomical or impractical to take those volumes of data and load them into the data warehouse. So traditional approaches let us down at this point. So the difficulties that we need to work with and address include capturing, storing, searching, sharing, analyzing, and visualizing this data, which essentially is the flow of demonstrations and theory that I have here for you this morning. Apache Hadoop. So this is one big data platform. It's a set of open source projects that allow transforming commodity hardware, simply storage servers, into a service that can store huge volumes of data potentially. Um, allow huge distributed computations to take place. So how it works is uh, that jobs are sent across to every node within a cluster and down to the file systems and the processing happens there in parallel. And then a reduced process brings the results together and consolidates them and that's how the querying works. And so the thing that we need to be aware of here, in particular with business intelligence, that when we're feeding data for analysis purposes, a human's going to be involved at some point, and they have certain tolerances when it comes to how long they're prepared to wait for a query to uh, return to them. Uh, so that's why we use techniques like cubes with MOLAP and tabular models with in-memory. These technologies have been designed about storing and optimizing data to provide rapid response at query time. And what you need to appreciate up front is, that the big data platform isn't about high responsiveness. It just isn't practical when you consider the large volumes and the parallel processing and consolidation that's taking place. So we'll talk about the considerations at the end of this session you need to take on board when you're using a source from big data as part of your business intelligence. Key attributes, so redundant and reliable, so when you're using the Hadoop file system, there is redundancy built in. Should one of the nodes go down, there is going to be copies of the data elsewhere that can be used. It's batch processing centric. A query will fire off a series of jobs and batches, and this is why we don't get fast response time. There's an enormous amount of work that goes on under the covers. 
Easy to program distributed applications. I'm not sure why I put that in there. I mean, relatively, for what you get, it's easy. But you may well need to uh, acquire good JavaScript skills if you need to customize exactly how you're going to access and query that big data. Uh, the demonstration today centers around using Hive. So this is an application built on top of the big data platform that facilitates you defining your data and accessing it in very familiar ways as tabular structures. So you can define these tables. They represent uh, objects that sit on top of the files in your distributed file system. And if you already know how to query a SQL table, then you pretty much know how to query a Hive table. There are a couple of small differences. Uh, but essentially, uh, it's easy to query by using these types of uh, applications of, such as Hive. Runs on commodity hardware. Uh, the story from Microsoft when it comes to storage is Azure. Using the blob store, you'll get your big data up there one way or another using some container. And then you can build a cluster on top of it in the cloud, and all your computation can be done up there. The benefits, of course, with this is it scales on demand. Pay for what you use when you need it. The elephant here, by the way, so the story is, and I really don't have the complete story, but the naming for Hadoop came from um, one of the pioneers of this technology, and their child had a toy, toy elephant. It was named Hadoop, and it just seemed very fitting that this uh, open source project would also bear the name. So Microsoft's implementation um, of Hadoop is named HD Insight. That's really the marketing and the branding around it. Uh, my point here says it's available both on Windows Server or as a Windows Azure service. Uh, really, in a production environment, it's a Windows Azure service. Microsoft do provide uh, the HD Insight server. In fact, it's what I'm demonstrating from today. Um, demonstrations, you learn to remove as much dependency from the internet as possible. Uh, and so I do that by having an HD Insight server locally. The aim of using HD Insight server is that it's really a sandbox and a development environment for you. You don't have to work with the cloud. You can build your solutions, test them locally, and then you can deploy them up to Azure. And that's where all your storage and computation will happen. All up, HD Insight empowers organizations to discover new insights. And that was really the focus of a session yesterday, was really to talk about the potential of what possible data stores um, could be uh, candidates for your big data solutions. Your classic OLTP systems are really not the consideration. We've solved that. We can ETL them quite effectively and economically into data warehouse structures. But when you consider that you might have, for example, web log information, and that's really where my demonstration starts today, is that the company has an e-commerce application. Certainly when we have transactions like uh, shopping baskets and checking out of those, that information is going to be stored in a sales system that will be readily available in conventional ways through your data warehouse. But what we're lacking is the ability to understand how customers are using the website. What are they doing? What are they browsing to? What do they browse from to and around? And in addition, what do they add to a shopping cart? What do they remove from the shopping cart? There's all sorts of interesting information that should you store that log information, have time and expertise to analyze it, that you could gain a better understanding of what your customers are doing, and then return back to the customers an improved experience to them, perhaps recommendation engines uh, about how they could use the data. So before we get into Power Pivot, let me start with the first demonstration. So I'm connecting here to a machine that I've named HD Insight. It has the HD Insight server installed. And the first thing I'll point out to you is that I have some web logs. OK, this is demonstration. This is not reality. Um, if I really only had four uh, web log files that didn't even total you know, 10 megabytes, this would not be a big data solution. But for the practicalities in a 75-minute session, uh, I've reduced it down to something a little more um, easy to work with. So essentially. I've got four years of web log data. And you can see here by the file name that it's broken down by, by year. Go ahead, open this, and show you the content of one of them. So reasonably standard stuff. The IP address, the authenticated customer, the unique session identifier that's going to be useful for us to analyze what happens within a single session timestamp, and then the request that was made. So note that when a request is made to the browse web page, uh, we have included in the query string the product ID that they browse to. And then finally, the request status and the number of bytes that were transferred. 
So what I then do is open up the HD Insight dashboard. And by using the interactive console, I can use JavaScript. I can then work with the file system. And so my first step here is to provision a directory to store that data. Because presently, it's just sitting on the server. It's not sitting in the distributed file system. So I make a directory named data. And then if you want to learn about the commands that are available, just by using that hash or that pound symbol, you'll see all of the available commands. What's going to be of use to me here is the copy from local. I'm able to copy an entire folder, my weblog folder, into the data directory. So I'll take this folder path. And I will place that into the data directory. So now if I list the content, you'll see that those four CSV files are now sitting in the distributed file system. In order to query that data, I then switch across to the Hive console. And this is where I can create a Hive statement that will create a table. And for convenience, I have a snippet. Whoops, wrong file. Assets, snippets, and let me copy this in and explain. So the command here is to create an external table. So it's not truly a table of data. It's really metadata that describes how you can access and query the files. It's named weblog. Within parentheses, I have a comma-separated list of the columns by name and by data type. Uh, I'll point out one thing here that's a, a little frustrating, but not terribly difficult to work around. While I have a date and time field within the weblog, uh, Hive in this version, I think this is version 10, doesn't have a date time data type. So we have to bring it in as a string. So it'll be up for us when we actually query it later on to parse and to convert that to the appropriate types. Uh, that is ready, I think, for version 12 of Hive. We will have that data type. Beyond the definition of the table, row format, delimited fields, terminated by commas. There's a comma-separated value format. And then stored as text files in this location on the distributed file system. So now when I evaluate this, essentially evaluate means execute the command, um, that is now metadata that describes an object. And then I can go ahead and query that metadata. Describe formatted weblog. So note that that first command took about 3.322 seconds. Let's keep an eye on those statistics. OK, so this gives me details about the definition of the table. Uh, perhaps a little more informative. Show table extended like weblog. OK, so further statistics. But of note here is that when you query this table, under the covers, you're really querying four documents or four files. And that's dynamic, as you would keep uploading data in, in the form of files into your blob store um, that would automatically be recognized as part of this table, providing it's stored in that weblog data table or directory. OK, last command that I'll execute will be, what are the number of rows in the weblog table? So remember what we said about latency, and this is the killer when delivering a business intelligence application. If you can't deliver credible data in good time, users simply won't adopt or trust it. And so here, very patiently, I'm executing a query that simply says, we'll count the number of rows found across all of those four CSV files. Are we still patiently waiting? Or have we switched across to Facebook, and we're updating our status, and we've even forgotten the fact that we've executed this query? And then maybe we do switch back later on. And then we see the result, but we've completely forgotten the query that we submitted. So it's very dangerous to interpret that result because we've lost context. And so this is a very, very important point. Um, being a business intelligence practitioner, where I see my interest with big data is uh, building traditional business intelligence applications on top of big data, and then really truly leveraging MOLAP in memory, report snapshots, and so on, so that we can process in an off-peak period and prepare the data. Um, and so that when users do connect to my reports and my data models, the data's cached ready to go. There's none of this processing that needs to happen in the background. So take a look here. The result is, 
interestingly enough, exactly 100,000 rows of data. Yes, this is not truly big data. And uh, on the right-hand side here, we see uh, information about all of the jobs and their status that was uh, really uh, executed as part of that command. All up, that took about 45 seconds, which I think you would all agree would be an unacceptable form of latency for someone that simply wants to know how many logs do we have. That's the work that I'm doing on the HD Insight server. Now I'm switching across to my business intelligence server. And the IT pro could come in here and assist me by installing the Hive ODBC driver. So this is what would need to be installed in order to connect using ODBC across to the HD Insight platform. It's a simple process to set up. I just accept the terms, install. Now that the driver is installed, we can come in and define an ODBC data source. So here is a user data source name. When I add, you'll note that the Hive driver is now available. Click Finish, data source name, HD Insight. On my network, the name of the server is HD Insight. And by the way, it could have been installed on the same machine. It doesn't have to be installed separately. However, I have SharePoint installed on here for demonstration purposes. SharePoint requires a domain controller. You can't have a domain controller and HD Insight installed on the same machine. Not at the moment anyway. And that's why I have them separated. No authentication, which is a bit odd. Uh, you'd expect that if we have data stored somewhere, that it would be protected and credentials would be required to gain access to it. Uh, in the preview at the moment, the encryption and authentication has not been implemented. So there's no authentication supported. And now that that data source name is created, I can hand it across to the business analyst, and they can use that data source name to connect to and submit Hive queries. And that's your introduction to HD Insights, specifically working with Hive to create a table across large volumes and content of weblog. Now the topic of self-service business intelligence that's going to use that big data. So here who in the audience already has experience working with Power Pivot. So I would at a guess say it's about 20% of you. Uh, Power Pivot uh, was first released as an add-in for Excel 2010. Uh, I have been very excited by this and I continue to get excited by this product because what we're enabling here with this uh, feature in Excel and now built directly into Excel 2013 in Professional Plus Edition is that you're empowering business users to create reasonably sophisticated data models that can integrate data from multiple sources, can work with extremely large volumes of data. So we do have a restriction in Excel when working and importing data into the workbook itself. Does anyone know what the maximum number of rows are that are supported in a worksheet? One million? Yeah, to be precise, it's 1,048,576 rows. And uh, that's two to the power of 20, if you're interested to know how they came up with that number. Uh, the fact is, you know, going back to uh, 10 years ago, that was an awful amount of data. Um, we wouldn't have conceived that you'd really need ever, practically, to bring in a million rows of data. And the fact is, in recent years, that's not a lot of data. And so if you need to work with large volumes of data, you don't have a choice in Excel except to use Power Pivot if you're going to start working with uh, in excess of what a worksheet will support. So the great news about this technology, and internally it uses analysis services, X-Velocity in-memory analytics engine, what will happen is that when you import data, it will read the data, it will encode it, it will then compress at column level, and it will provide high compression, typically one-tenth of the original size of the data that you're sourcing from. It's optimized also for analytic queries, so for filtering, for group by, and for aggregation. It does this extremely fast, and all of this technology works in memory. So that's what Power Pivot does. It allows you to integrate from multiple sources, potentially different data sources and formats. It allows you to work with larger volumes of data than Excel was ever intended to work with. And then it allows you to enrich this data model by renaming columns, hiding columns, hiding tables, introducing hierarchies for navigation to aggregate things at measures at different levels of granularity. Uh, it allows you then to introduce calculations. And what happens then is this becomes a data source that can be used internally within the workbook itself uh, by using pivot tables, pivot charts, power view, cube functions. Okay, 
story doesn't finish there because if you publish this to SharePoint and you have the Power Pivot add-in installed, essentially that's a deployment story. That data model is stored inside the XLSX document. It becomes a document in SharePoint. You can grant privileges to it, and then users can connect to it via the URL. And essentially that will gain them the access to query the data model. Last story is that they can also configure data refresh in SharePoint. So to keep the data current in the data model, this can be automated through a policy configured by the business user themselves. And the brilliance of this entire story is that IT don't necessarily need to get involved. They would install Excel, they would probably, and I would suggest provide training, and then leave it for the business users to gain access to the data, build their own models, and then answer the questions that they have. So where the story goes to if, uh, in this demo is that we have a need to analyze the web log data. We've seen that the web log data has information like authenticated customer, uh, the date. We've seen also that the product can be extracted from the URL. So there's certain information that could be of interest to us to analyze. And that's what we'll do here. So my starting point then is to go ahead and launch Excel. And when you look across the ribbon, what I expect to see is a tab that is the Power Pivot tab. And so I like to show you this in demonstration because it's not there by default. Excel 2013 Power Pivot is an add-in, but it is actually baked into Excel itself, but it is not enabled. Um, does anyone understand why Microsoft would make us go through this process of going to our options, coming to add-ins, managing the com add-ins, and then explicitly enabling the Power Pivot add-in. Note that when I do that, I get a tab on the ribbon. Why don't we just have this enabled by default? Right, these add-ins, they slow down the loading of Excel and they consume resources, okay? And so the fact is, uh, there's an interesting statistic that Excel is used by you know, hundreds of millions of people every day, no at least once a month, apparently the statistic is. I think between 500 and 600 million Excel users on the planet. How many of them do you think would be using Power Pivot each time? <laughs> Probably a very, very small portion. We'd like to think it's higher, and over time I'm guessing it will become more. Uh, but the fact is Microsoft chose not to enable it by default simply because the majority of users will not be using it. So for those that need it, you need to recognize that it's available. You need to go through that process of explicitly enabling the add-in. And when you do, you can then come across to the Power Pivot tab, and then you can manage the model. So what I like to do first of all is just save this as a blank workbook. Web log analysis. And I'll just point out that as a blank workbook, this document size comes to seven and a half kilobytes. Now I switch across to the Power Pivot tab. When I click Manage, opens up what we call the Power Pivot window. And it's inside this window where you'll define how data is accessed, you'll import data, and you'll configure the definition of the data model. So here on the Home tab is where we can retrieve data from external sources. Uh, from database are the Microsoft database products of SQL Server, Access, and uh, analysis services, be it a cube or a tabular database, or in fact, another Power Pivot workbook that's in SharePoint. From data service, you can bring in data from feeds. I'll demonstrate that shortly. The rest, all available here in other sources. So scrolling down through this list, I notice that I have this one here for ODBC. And that's how I'm going to use that user um, data source name. Click Next. Here I am in the table import wizard. What's a friendly name that defines this connection? I'm just going to call it HD Insight. And then to build up the connection string, I click here. Very strange, I did click on build. Uh-oh. Some gremlin is in my demo, can you just bear with me a moment? Mm -hmm. 
problem. Okay, found the problem. Virtual machines take up a lot of disk space. And I've got a number of snapshots for other presentations I'm doing, and they have just taken up all my disk space. So it said, hey, I'm running out of disk space. I'm going to pause the virtual machine. So let me just clean up by deleting one file. Resume, resume. There we are. Apologies for that. <laughs> Sometimes snapshots deceivingly can take up gigabytes and gigabytes of data. OK, so what I've just done there is clicked on build. This allows me then to define how the ODBC connection will be defined. This is straightforward because the drop down list here enumerates all of the data source names that I've already defined on the machine. Now that the connection's been defined, the table import wizard gives me choice. It says, well, do you want to import from a list of tables and views that this data source supports, or do you want to write your own query? Um, I could take this option, which is to say, well, I'll select from existing tables. And when I click Next, there's the web log table. And I could even come in here and preview and filter. All right, And this is actually one of the biggest optimizations of Power Pivot that I make my students aware of and my customers, is that because of the in-memory nature of a data model, you do not want to introduce data that's not relevant for your calculations, for the analysis that needs to be done. So there's two ways that you can filter the data. The first is you can vertically filter by removing columns. The second is you can horizontally filter by using where clauses at column level. Only bring in uh, the log information for the year 2008, for example. Uh, now, the preview here is just giving me a snapshot, a sample of the data. Just be very, very careful. Um, if you come in here and use the drop down here to filter, what this will do is want to come up with all of the distinct values that you can filter by. What do you think is going to happen with a big data source? <laughs> it's actually going to go and submit a query to find the distinct values, and that could take literally minutes for it just to populate that drop down list. I've done that in demo before, and that was a bigger delay than me just fixing that um, snapshot issue. So I'm going to cancel. I'm going to switch back, and I'm going to say, look, instead of using a table definition that could be filtered vertically, horizontally, how about I just write a Hive query? And therefore, what I can do is name the query. So this will become weblog. And in my snippets here, I have the Hive query. Essentially, bring in date time, account ID, session ID, and then use the substring function to extract the characters from character 28 onwards, which would give me the product ID. Now, when you look at the from clause, it's coming from the web log. And the where clause is ensuring that we're only getting logged items where the browse.aspx page has actually been requested. And finally, that we had a successful request with a result of 200. So I copy this and paste it into, well, it's not really a SQL statement, is it? It's a Hive statement. And now when I click Finish, the table import wizard is connecting, sending down that Hive query. What is happening on my HD Insight server is a MapReduce job is implicitly being created. If this was up in the cloud, that Reduce job would be sent 
or that map job, excuse me, which is sent to every node in the cluster, and then it's just churning through all the log data. Once they've finished their task, they then submit that to the reduce process, and then the consolidation of all of the map jobs take place, and then the result comes back to us here on the client. There we see it. Power Pivot has been able to retrieve, of those 100,000 rows, 72,341 were requests to the browse.aspx page. And essentially, the big data platform plays no further role because that data has now been retrieved and stored inside my data model. And we could disconnect from the entire big data platform at this point. We are no longer subject to the latency that we're going to or that we've seen so far. Let me save the workbook and just point out to you that the size of this workbook has now grown to about two and a half megabytes. So essentially, it's the metadata that describes the model and it's 72,000 rows of compressed data. So that's just the starting point for my model development. It's brought in a lot of fact information about each web log item. What I then need to do is enrich this model. Let me switch to diagram view. By bringing in additional tables of data that describe my customers, that provide attributes like their geographic location, their gender, uh, product attributes like category, subcategory, and we need further information about date and time. To analyze effectively date and time, I would like to see that I've got a table of data that would include columns like year, quarter, month, and so on. So this is where the corporate data warehouse helps out. I'm going to create a second data connection in this workbook, connecting to the local host here and the AdventureWorks data warehouse. OK, I think local host there is being spelled with two L's. Let's be patient again while it times out looking for that server. Or cancel. So having defined that connection, Again, what I could do is just bring in a table level. Um, I just find that it's easier to write queries. So let me first create a query that will bring in customer. By clicking the design button here, it brings up a graphical designer. So remembering that the audience for Power Pivot is not necessarily an IT professional, someone that's going to need a little bit of guidance at times in producing things like queries. Does anyone recognize where this query builder comes from? Does it look familiar to anyone? I think this is a good example at some times at Microsoft that the different product teams perhaps share the same cafeteria and they sit there and have lunch at the same table. And you can just see the Power Pivot people saying, well, we need to build a graphical experience for querying a relational table. And the report builder team says, well, we've already done that. <laughs> Why don't you just borrow what we've done? So that's in fact what it is. If you work with report builder, this is the relational query designer. So of all of the tables in the data warehouse, I'm interested in the customer table. Specifically, I need the customer alternate key, that is the source system's primary key. That is what we found in the web log as the authenticated user. Additional information like first name, last name, uh, gender. And then because there's a relationship to the dim geography table, I'm able then to introduce fields from that table also. So I'm interested in city, state province name, and the English country region name. To test this, I can run the query. And that's what the result looks like. We could also apply filters here, but there's none that I need to apply. So when I click OK, the resulting SQL statement has been copied into the box here. And then I use my ability here to say, well, look, it's not exactly what I want, especially the column names. So if you know SQL, and here's some basics, just by aliasing a column, that will then become the column name in the model. And it just saves me the effort of having to rename it again in the model. So I'll just alias this as customer ID. Here, I'm going to concatenate a space and bring these two columns together. And this just becomes the customer. State province name can be more concisely described as state. And the English country na region name could just be country. And now that's still a valid select statement. And that results in an additional table being added to the model, 18,484 customers.
So now the data model consists of two data sources, two tables. I'm going to go through that process one more time. Um, now here is a beginner's trap, is typically when they say, oh, OK, I need to bring in a second table from the same data source, the data warehouse, they just go ahead and they launch the table import wizard. Its first step is then to define the data connection. You end up defining multiple data connections to the same data source. This is not a good practice. What you really need to do is open up existing connections, select the connection, and when you open it, it launches the table import wizard based on that connection. So again, writing a query, this time to define product. And in the AdventureWorks data warehouse, product is a snowflake dimension. So we have the category table, the subcategory, and the product. So starting with product, I need the product alternate key. That again is a source system's key value that we found in the query string of the browse.aspx requests. Uh, we will need the English product name. I'll need color. And then in the related subcategory table, I'll bring in the product subcategory. And then the category table, I have the English product category name. Now, in the AdventureWorks data warehouse, there's a slowly changing dimension configured on this table of type 2, which means that products are stored at version level. So I'm then going to have to apply a filter that makes a request that only current versions are returned. So I have a status column here, only where the status is current. And an additional filter that I know is going to be useful is that I'm only interested in finished goods flags. There are other components that AdventureWorks makes, but they go into other finished products. And we know that users don't browse for components. So let's go ahead and apply a filter here. This makes the model much more efficient by not storing data that's irrelevant. And now I end up with this set. Clicking OK, there's the resulting SQL statement. Note the WHERE clause here. And again, I go ahead and alias to clean up the names. Two hundred and ninety five products. So the data model is starting to take shape. Customer, product, web log. Now, vital to any data model to support time analysis is that you have a date table. And in fact, for web log analysis, we can take it to a level beneath this that we can have a timetable as well that would give us the hours and the minutes of a day. And that way we could analyze right down to the minute what was going on on a certain date. So to make this a little more interesting at AdventureWorks, to support the self-service business intelligence, the IT group have published some corporate feeds. And here they've published the date and time information. And this is to ensure that we have consistency in all of the Power Pivot models that are created. We encourage and we educate the users to go ahead and source their date information from this location. So in the Power Pivot window, the way that I can import data from a feed is here from data service, from an OData feed. When I click Browse then, I can navigate across to the AdventureWorks site and to the data feeds library. corporate feeds, click Next. It recognizes that service consists of two feeds, date and time. So let's start with date. Preview and filter here. Um, for feeds, you cannot apply where clauses. You can't do horizontal filtering, but we can certainly remove columns that we don't want. So of importance will be only a selection of these columns. So the default is that all columns are selected. My big friend here is this first checkbox that deselects everything. In fact, it's my suggestion that that's the way the default should be set. It should force you to just add what you need only. What I will need is the date key. I will also need the date value for reasons that I'll describe shortly. And then to provide user-friendly labels, I have the date label. I have month label. And 
we'll use calendar period. So you see all of these attributes that have been predefined for me, calendar quarter label and the calendar year label. And then the second feed that I'll bring in will be for time. And so note here that the time key is a numeric value that is really the minute of the day. The way that it's being produced is the hour has been multiplied by 100, and then you have added the minute within the hour. So midnight is zero, one minute past midnight is number one. 10 a.m. in the morning would be 1000, and 10.30 in the morning would be 10030. So it's just a human readable numeric integer uh, that we can use to express the minutes within a day. Attributes like hour, 15 minute interval, and right down to the minute, I'll bring them all in. And now when I click Finish, this will introduce two tables into my data model. And now let's just reflect that this data model consists of three data sources, one to big data with HD Insight, one to the data warehouse with SQL Server, and another to a data feed. So the next step then is to integrate all of these tables by defining relationships. So let's start with defining relationships for the date and time. Now, when I go across to the web log table, recall that the date time that I had coming from the CSV files and that the hive table defined is actually a string. So the selection of this column tells me that that is just text, but knowing that the values can be cast as date time, I can then switch that across to true date. In order to establish relationships between these tables, they need to be single column relationships. And you can see already that for the date table, that the unique identifier is the date key. Essentially, it's the year multiplied by 10,000, add the month number of year multiplied by 100, and then add the day number. And what, again, we have a human readable key that is also chronologically sorted. And again, for time, we described the key earlier. So switching back to the web log table, what I'll do is extend the table definition by defining two calculated columns. Here, I'll use the DAX expression, and that's data analysis expressions, largely based on Excel functions, so reasonably straightforward for an Excel user to grasp, but it includes functions that Excel has never been designed to work with, like relationship navigation, time intelligence. Uh, what I'm going to do here is use a function that says, go ahead and extract the year of this column and multiply that by 10,000. and then add to it, by using the month function, what the month number is of the date and time, and multiply by 100, and then finally add to it the day number of that date and time. So this DAX expression, if I typed it incorrectly, mm -hmm, gives me that numeric key that I need to relate to my date table. So then I can go ahead and rename this and just call this the date key. In similar fashion, create a second calculated column, use the hour function to extract the hour of that date and time and multiply it by 100. And then add the minute portion of that date and time to come up with this key value here. Rename, this becomes my time key. So now switching back to the diagram view, this is just, I think, the easiest way to define relationships, and always create the relationship by dragging from the many side to the one side. So now I can take this date key and drag it from here to here, and the time key from here to here. The account ID matches the customer ID, and the product ID matches the product ID. And here we've effectively integrated three sources together, to create one integrated store of data. Next thing then is to optimize and enrich each individual table. So I start with the date table, I switch across to the grid view definition, and the first and important thing that I do here is on the design tab is I mark this as a date table. That tells the engine that this is where date is defined. Why this is important is that um, Tools like pivot tables, if you filter on an attribute from this table, it will know it's a time-related filter. It will give you time-related filter options. Next is that with DAX, there are 33, I think, time intelligence functions. They only work if you have the date table marked in your model. 
What's required to mark a date table is that you must have a date column. It happens to be the date column, which is this column here. And the rule is this, in order for this to work properly, from your minimum to maximum date values in that table, there must be no missing gaps. And then you must have a date column that is of type date, and then all you need to do is mark that table as a date table. Next, the words label on here is not very friendly for someone that's connecting to and querying this model. So I rename them simply as, in this case, day, month, quarter, and year. Remember when I aliased the queries earlier? I've just saved myself doing that. But in a data feed, I had no potential to go ahead and provide an alias. Of concern when I look at filtering the month is the default sort order is going to be alphabetic. That's not going to help because for month, we need chronologic sorting. OK, so what I'm able to do is sort by another column in the same table. And what I'm going to do then is come back to the table properties. This would look familiar to you. You can come back and configure the definition of your table. And that's why we have a month key column. This month key is the year multiplied by 100 and the month number of year added to it. So that's a sortable column. Now that I change that definition, you'll now see that I've got an additional column on the table. I can then come back to this month column. And then I can say sort by column sort by the month key. This will only work if there's a true one-to-one -one relationship between the values in these columns. And now take a look when I go to filter the month column, January, February, March, April, May. Now, last step is to define a hierarchy in my date table. So in order to define a hierarchy, I need to do this in diagram view. I maximize the table to make it easy for me to do what I'm doing. And then just by multi-selecting these columns, I can create a hierarchy based on that collection. And now I have a calendar hierarchy to navigate from year, quarter, month, to day. Anyone understand why it got the order right? Did it just make that up? Does it know that year comes before quarter and quarter becomes before month? So in fact, what it does is actually look at your data. And where it can, it will actually sequence them correctly. If it didn't get it right, and typically it doesn't, if you don't have sufficient volumes of data, you just drag and drop these to resequence the levels of your hierarchy. Final optimization, I multi-select all of the columns, and I hide them from client tools. What this means now is that anyone connecting to this data model will see one visible resource in the date table that is the calendar hierarchy. Next, move on and do the same thing now for the timetable. So we have hour. This is probably better expressed as quarter hour. And then we have minute. And then I can assemble a hierarchy from these. Would become the time hierarchy. And I would hide these. Next for customer. Clearly a hierarchy from country, state, city, down to customer. So this could be a geography hierarchy. And I would hide all except the gender. And then for product, same thing. So the optimizations for your dimension style tables, your entities, is pretty much rename columns, sort columns if you need to, like the month, uh, produce hierarchies, and high columns that you don't want users to ever access. So typically your keys, product key, doesn't make sense to analyze. We don't want the users to even see it. When it comes to optimizing the tables that store your facts, like the web log, this is where we define a different type of calculation. So what these data models do exceedingly well is that they filter, group by, and they aggregate. In order to aggregate, we should define explicit calculations on what they're aggregating. What do you think the candidates might be in this table that we'd want to analyze by aggregating? We can filter by time period, date period, customer, product. 
when we filter the rows in this table, what do we want to aggregate and analyze? Commonly, you have measures that are additive that you can sum, like sales amount. We don't have that in this table. What we do have, well, we have the customer code here, and we have the session. So I'm going to multi-select both of these. And up here, I can use the auto sum, and I choose to use the distinct count aggregate function. That will create two calculations down here that we call calculated fields. They also use DAX in the way that I define calculated columns. So while it uses the same expression language, there are different types of calculations. Calculated column is a new column to the table. It actually materializes the values and stores them in the table. These calculations are stored in metadata only. And at query time, they're used to typically aggregate the filtered sets of data according to the context defined by your query. The way that they're defined is the first part is the name of the calculated field. So I'm going to rename that to customers, colon, equals some DAX expression, typically involving aggregation. So here I have distinct count of the account ID column. Now, usually you get to see the result here. There seems to be some bug in the product. Um, you would typically see a preview of what that distinct count on that column is. For the distinct count of session ID, I'm just going to call this sessions. So now we can analyze by time period, by geography, what were the number of customers that were browsing? What were the number of distinct sessions that users or customers had logged on and done? I'm going to introduce one more calculated field just to demonstrate the time intelligence capabilities. So what about sessions year to date? And there's a DAX function called total year to date. In order for this function to work, you need to have a date table marked in the model. So that's already been done. What expression will be aggregated? Just use the sessions measure. And then it wants to know where in the model your date column is. Remember that requirement when marking a date table? And now that total year to date function introduces that for me. So then what I like to do is just format that all of these are whole numbers with a 1,000 separator. Switch back to diagram view. And so now what we see is that the web log table contains these calculations. So the final step in my optimization is that I hide these. Those base columns are not useful at all. The aggregation will be useful, and they're exposed explicitly through calculations. And that's the power pivot development. The entire workbook now, consisting of metadata and data, comes to 3.76 megabytes. That's Power Pivot. Are there any questions at this stage about data modeling with Power Pivot? None. OK. So the second topic is to then explore how we can report from this, and specifically with Power View. I mean, I really could spend an entire session just exploring all of the ways that you can consume and query a tabular model. So there's pivot tables, pivot charts, cube functions, apps for Office. I covered some of these in a session yesterday. Focusing on the new features in Excel 2013, this is where I can introduce Power View. So Power View first made available with SQL Server 2012 reporting services and available only through SharePoint, is now available on the client inside Excel with 2013. We can now insert Power View sheets alongside worksheets within the workbook. And by default, if you have a Power Pivot model within the workbook, the Power View sheet will connect to and expose via a field list the visible resources that you've defined in your model. So this reporting experience is about high presentation, highly interactive, rich metadata-driven experiences that can uh, produce really good-looking results uh, quickly with few clicks as possible and uh, potentially with minimal training as well. What drives the best experience, by the way, is a well-designed and optimized data model like what I've just demonstrated. There are some new features that I'll point out here in Excel 2013 with PowerView. Uh, they include maps. So by using Bing Maps, providing you have internet connectivity, we can now uh, spatially represent our data. There are pie charts, 
Hierarchies as I defined for date, time, geography, and products can now be exposed and used. Key performance indicators, of which I have none in this demonstration, are also now supported. Drill down, drill up, reporting styles, themes, text resizing, background images, hyperlinks, and printing capabilities are new features to look forward to in Excel 2013. Let's then take a look in demonstration. So here I am in the workbook, single worksheet named Sheet 1. Don't even need it. When I come on the Insert tab, I can now insert a PowerView sheet. Interestingly, this is another add-in that is installed automatically but not enabled by default. But the good news is you don't need to go through that long process of opening up options to turn the add-in on. The first request to create the sheet will just ask you, do you want to enable the add-in? Yes. And then it inserts a new PowerView sheet. It detects that there is a PowerPivot data model. So that model will become the source for this. Just out of interest, you can connect to an external tabular data model. That could be a Power Pivot workbook in SharePoint, or it could be a tabular database hosted on an analysis services instance on your network. On the right-hand side, then, we see the field list exposing the visible resources that I defined. There's my three calculations. So, web log analysis. Becomes the title of this report. Uh, here in the date table, there's my calendar hierarchy. Let me bring in the year level. And when you bring in a single field, it by default creates a table consisting of a single column. This is it here. If it is a single column table, you can then switch this across to become a slicer. And a slicer then provides interactive filtering in the sheet itself. New in this release is you can increase the font size. So I always like to make this large. And then you can select, even multi-select. You can clear the selection to bring in all. So let me just use 2008. Uh, let me bring in another filter. So from my customer table, let's take a look at You know, I can do country. I was trying to do something a little European. The data doesn't support it very well. So we can also filter by country. And then by clicking in a blank area, it allows you to define a whole new structure. So how about I do this? Uh, let's bring in, basically, by city and by web log table, Let's bring in the number of sessions. So there's that big data. Were we waiting 45 seconds for that response? No, it's instantaneous. Big data result was queried well in advance of this experience and has been cached and is now in memory. So here I have a table. Look, I could sort this in descending order, and I could see that most of our sessions are coming out of London. Uh, much more interesting than to switch this across to a map. OK, you will need to enable and approve that PowerView communicates with the Bing Map service. And then we get to see where all of our sessions are occurring. So I'm Australian. How about I filter down on Australia only? Uh, I need to switch that to a slicer. And then I can filter on Australia. And then I can start to see where my customers are coming in. And that's what happened in 2008. Uh, we can also configure this so that the product information could come through as well. Let's add category to the color. And what that will do is add the distinct categories to the legend and then use a pie chart to represent what type of browsing was going on in the different locations. And I'm from Melbourne, so let me focus in on here. Okay, so you can just hover over, and there's the information that allows us to analyze uh, where our customers are coming in from and what they're browsing. Can I add a second sheet? Power view. And what's going on with year to date sessions? So if I bring in my month. Let's bring in sessions year to date. And actually, it usually helps to put in something like this. So I can select, copy, and paste it. 
So now if we look at 2008, and then if I convert this across to a bar chart, we can now appreciate year-to-date sessions that are taking place. There's PowerView. Any questions? Tip of the iceberg, if you notice a PowerView session, we could go to town on the spatial data of working with hierarchies, drilling through, drilling across. But the idea is, seeing now that that big data result is now highly performant and the interactive experience we get from it, that latency is no longer an issue. OK, so let's consider and reflect on the demonstrations and the theory that I've presented so far and consider the benefits of big data and data modeling with PowerPivot. So data models, as I've demonstrated, can surface big data in an intuitive way to promote rapid exploration, analysis, and reporting. I hope I've proven to you that it can be easily done, providing that you've got the connectivity, that Hive table is established. Self-service potential is you can use that ODBC connection. It is also possible and may be relevant in some situations to create linked servers in SQL Server, and then users don't even know they're querying big data. What you can do is create a linked server that connects to the HD Insight server, create views that query the Hive table, and then users just connect to the data warehouse and query the views. There's no concept that they're actually even connecting to a big data store. Power Pivot workbooks and then can become a data source for other experiences. Locally within the same workbook, I can use PowerView and other experiences to create reports. If I publish this to SharePoint and grant permissions to it, other users can then query that big data via the embedded data model. Now, there are considerations when doing this. Naturally, big data results might be too large to store in memory. I mean, theoretically, that's why we have the big data platform. We've got large volumes of data. So the challenge that we have is making this big data small and relevant data. And so you can achieve that by minimizing the amount of data that you can load into the workbook. You can do this by retrieving a smaller time period. Maybe I don't need the last 10 years. Let's just focus on 2013. Decrease the dimensionality. Maybe we're not analyzing at product level. Don't bring in the product ID. Just bring in date and time, customer, and, uh, and take it from there. You can also increase the grain. Maybe it's not relevant to know what happened within the 24 hours of a single day. So we can use group by in a hive to actually group by and then bring in an aggregated set. OK, nat naturally, once you increase the grain, you can't go down anymore. But that's a decision you make up front. The result would be a smaller set coming down, and that could make it more manageable and practical for your model. The other approach is you could use a sample of the data. And you could then say, well, if we take every 10th row and we just multiply our calculations by 10, it's not going to be 100% accurate, but it's highly representative. So sampling is another technique that can be used to effectively analyze big data. Once you've seen that the big data is, uh, sorry, once the big data has actually been loaded, cached in memory, we no longer have the latency uh, of the big data querying process. So there were my three demonstrations, creating an HD Insight solution, creating a workbook based on HD Insight and other data sources, including SQL Server and an, uh, a data service, and then creating Excel reports. There are additional resources. Microsoft Big Data, there's a home page here for the Big Data site, being updated continuously with uh, new resources. Uh, HD Insight services for Windows. Uh, and a good blog here on Big Data for Everyone, how familiar tools like Power Pivot, uh, analysis services, uh, data models, data mining can be used on top of Hadoop. So strongly encourage that you check out these resources. So at this stage, I'll ask, are there any questions? It's been a very quiet audience. I guess I might be answering all of your questions in demonstration, but now would be the time if you have any questions to raise them, and I'll be happy to answer them for the audience. Yes, sir. So the question about refreshing data. OK, so the web logs are accumulating over time. We would appreciate that we wouldn't have to refresh historic data, because we don't expect that the web logs have changed historically. So in a Power Pivot example, when it comes to refresh, you must refresh an entire table at a time. What that's going to mean, then, is you need to go through that entire process, as I did when I initially loaded the table. That Hive query needs to be sent. The result comes back, and it 
it typically replaces the entire set of the table. So there's several ways to do it. On demand, if you open up the workbook on the client, you can go in and refresh the data model. You can even do that in the Power View uh, ribbon. If you click refresh, it will refresh the entire data model. That what, what that means is it will refresh every data connection and every table that belongs to those data connections. Yes, that is going to be slow. Users will learn not to do that. Um, the other approach is if you publish this workbook to SharePoint, uh, you can then configure a data refresh policy, and you can say every 2 a.m., go ahead and just refresh that. Now, this is a self-service BI solution. If you found that that was becoming an obstacle, and yes, we need to process it every day to get the latest information, it would be appropriate then to take this Power Pivot workbook and to create a tabular project that IT would manage. The benefit of being a tabular project is once deployed, it becomes a tabular database in analysis services, and you can use partitioning. And therefore, what you can do is partition by time period, and then you only need to process the partition that needs to be updated. So Hive supports partitioning as well, that if you structure those files, typically by storing them in folders using timestamps, and you define those partitions with the Hive table, it's then efficient because the Hive query will target just the documents that belong to that partition set. All right, so there's improvements you can do for um, partitioning at the Hive end, and then you can uh, update the model just by processing the partitions that require updating, i.e. your current partition. Okay, any other questions? All right, I'm a little ahead of time, which is uh, a little surprising. So what I'll share with you is that there are other sessions that could be a benefit to you this week. Uh, when it comes to big data, data management in Microsoft HD Insight, a topic on Friday at 4.30. There's also a topic on governance for self-service BI. So one of the concerns with Power Pivot is IT get a little nervous that these data models are popping up everywhere. This spread mart scenario could get out of hand. So there is an entire story about how IT can maintain oversight, especially when using SharePoint documents. Power Pivot workbooks that are stored in SharePoint can be monitored by IT. They can monitor them for server resources, for performance, for data refresh failures. They can keep track of this. An entire story that would be covered in a session that I haven't listed here, it was my oversight, but a session on Friday that looks at governance for self-service BI. Okay, your standard resources, Channel 9, TechNet, Learning, MSDN. Uh, we very much appreciate evaluations for these sessions. It helps us understand whether we've met your requirements. It helps us plan for future events. So we would very much appreciate, and we provide you the convenience of a QR code here. If you could please evaluate the session, let us know what you thought. Feedback, good or bad, it is all welcome. So I'll take this opportunity to thank you very much for your time and attendance. I hope you got some good benefit from this session, and thank you very much.